G'day YouTubers, in this episode I'm going to talk about tides and the depth lines on your charts and how to interpret both of these and how they relate to each other. It's a really important subject if you're going to go outside marked channels, you need to know whether you've got enough water that you're not going to run aground. For this video I'm going to use the Navionics map and the area around Peel Island. We'll look at the markings on the map and talk about how they relate to the actual amount of water you'll find there. As with any measurement, you have to have somewhere to measure it from. And these water depths are measured from the chart datum. The chart datum is regarded as the lowest possible astronomical tide. And what that means to you is that at a tide height of zero, these numbers should be roughly correct. Well, actually these numbers should be exactly correct. But I say roughly because every square foot of the bay hasn't been surveyed and these are area approximations. Now this is a traditional tide chart, the sort that was always printed in the almanacs that you could buy at any bait and tackle shop. They came out every year and they were printed with the tidal information for the major ports, plus variations for nearby minor ports. I don't recall where I learned it from, but everyone knew that Peel was, oh, at the time, 15-20 minutes difference from the Brisbane Bar, and the South Passage was a bit more than that. Everyone sort of knew how the tides work, but with today's technology you don't really need to know that. You can just look it up on the internet. And it's probably for that reason that I haven't used them for so long that I'm having trouble remembering what the variations were. If we just take a quick look at the tide chart for the Brisbane Bar and just a small section of it, the lowest tide height that I can see there at a low tide is 0.26 metres. So that means that you will have whatever's shown on the chart plus 0.26 metres of water. Of course that only applies at the Brisbane Bar because the tides vary slightly all through the bay. Fortunately for us, the variation in tide height throughout the bay has never been sufficient that I have needed to worry about it. Let's just have a look at Willie Weather's website. It's a nice free website. You can access it anytime from anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. You can even download an app for your phone if you want to, and that's also free. In this case, we're just interested in the tide time, so we'll have a look at them for three successive tides, high, low, and high again. Before we start applying these tide heights, though, let's set the ground rules for exactly what we're looking at in the various sections of this map. I have to say that I've always found it somewhat counterintuitive that the deeper areas of water are done in white in the maps, and as you go through the shades of blue from light to dark, the water gets shallower. But that's the way it's done. I guess it's for reasons of visibility. The light green areas are areas which may be exposed at low tide. And of course, there's also the ubiquitous satellite imagery for the land areas. But what we're really interested in is the depth numbers that are showing here. So let's zoom in on them and have a quick look. Suppose we want to know what the water depth will be at this point on Saturday the 10th of July 2021 at 10.19pm which is the high tide at that night. The high tide is 2.5 metres and the chart shows a water depth of 8.3 metres. So to get the water depth at that point we add those two numbers together and that comes to 10.8 metres so we should have 10.8 metres of water there at the high tide. Let's have a look at another example a little bit closer to the island. In this one the chart shows a water depth of 4.7 metres and supposing we want to know what the depth of water is in the low tide at 5.04 on the following Sunday, the tide charts tell us that that will be a 0.6 metre tide. Again we add it to the number of 4.7 and we should have 5.3 metres of water there. But what about the areas that are shaded in green to indicate that they may be exposed on some tides? If we look at the numbers there, you can see in the Navionics map, and indeed in most electronic maps, the numbers are prefixed with a minus sign. On a lot of paper maps, these numbers are underlined rather than having a minus sign in front of them, mainly because that's more visible. So what you do with these numbers is you subtract them from the tide height. So if we look at the late morning high tide on Sunday the 11th, that is at 1.8 metres, and suppose we want to fish just over the reef here, where it shows minus 0.3 metres, 
subtract that from the 1.8 meters so we should still have 1.5 meters of water there so no trouble getting a tinny in no trouble getting some trailer boats in there just be a bit careful of course because as i've said earlier these are area heights they're not covering every square foot of the bottom so you will have some variations and in some cases you will find some significant variations I've seen areas that have a pinnacle over a metre higher than the surrounding area. So be very careful if you're using these charts to go in particularly shallow water. Now so far we've just been looking at the tide heights from Willy Weather. That's a very convenient app to get it from. It's available as an app on the phone or there's a website as well where you can go to. There's plenty of others around too. Some of them are better than others though, so let's just have a look at a couple and I'll give you at least one caveat about them. And it's up to you to sort of pick one that works for you. I find Willy Weather's good, Fish Ranger's good, pretty much any of the Australian sites will work well. But be careful of some of the overseas ones that purport to show Australian tide heights. This site here is very useful for the amount of information it gives, but I can't really speak for its accuracy because I don't use it. What I am impressed with though, is that it gives the swell height and direction. It gives the wave height, which in every case here is the same as the swell height, but if there was significant wind, it could be different, or it should be different at least. More importantly, it gives the swell period, and that makes a huge difference to just how comfortable it is to be on the bay. The arrows are quite useful too. It's easy to judge whether the swell's going in the same direction as the wind or not. If it's wind against swell, then the waves will be steeper and a little bit rougher. The tide heights and the times seem about right. So although this appears to be a foreign website, it seems to have fairly accurate predictions for the tide. And so it should. They're easy to predict. One thing I will note though, is that the tide times are shown here for the Brisbane Bar as being exactly the same as Willy Weather shows for Peel, and indeed Fish Ranger. Now I've always been told since I was a young fella that the difference between the Brisbane Bar and Peel was I think roughly around 15 minutes, I can't remember exactly, but I know there was definitely supposed to be a difference, the old fisherman used to tell me it was different. So I guess that these websites aren't applying those differences. They're taking the nearest tidal datum and just using that time. And interestingly, the height is different though because this one shows a high tide of 1.45 metres at 10.18am on Sunday the 11th, whereas the Peel forecast at 10.18 that we've looked at before was 1.8 metres. I'm not sure what's going on with that since they're not varying the time. I'm a bit surprised that there's a variation in the height. So just be careful about things like that when you're reading these tables. This next slide shows a different page on the same website looking at the same time period. It just gives a different view of the same data basically. Now this one here is wildly inaccurate for our Peel Island. To find this one, I just did a search for Peel Island, Queensland tide forecast. And this one came up. There's no indication here to say where in the world this Peel Island is. But from the tide times, the tide heights and everything, it's obvious that it's not the Peel Island in Moreton Bay that we've been looking at. If it is, they've got a terrible prediction model, but I think it's probably somewhere else in the world. So be careful of that as well. If you're just doing a Google search, Make sure you're on the right spot. And this is the title predictions from Fish Ranger. I like Fish Ranger, it's got a lot of good features about it, and in particular, it gives me two wind models to compare. I find if both wind models agree with each other, it's a pretty safe prediction that they'll be reasonably accurate. But on the other hand, sometimes they're polar opposites. One will say it's nice and calm, the other will say there's going to be quite a breeze, and you can pretty much flip a coin and pick one. I'm not going to go into the wind models in this video, but if you want to have a look at them, just go to the Fish Ranger site. They explain it pretty well there. I'll put some links to all of these sites down in the video description below so you can go and have a look at them for yourselves. Before I start talking about the main purpose of doing this video, I'd just like to clear up a few misconceptions about tidal movements. 
The first of these is that the tidal bulges do not move around the Earth. The tidal bulges are largely static and the Earth moves under them. The other point about tidal bulges is that they can be thought of as two very long period waves. In most parts of the Earth, these waves have a period of just over 12 hours. There are exceptions to that, but that is the general rule. Another misconception is that the tidal bulges are solely due to the influence of the moon, and that's not correct either. The moon has a big influence, but as a kid, if you ever whirled a bucket of water around over your head, you'll understand that there's a force that pushes that water up and prevents it from falling out of the bucket when the bucket's over your head. The root cause of the force that prevents that water from falling out is called inertia. And it's that similar force that causes the tidal bulges from the rotation of the earth. The sun also has an effect on the tides as well as, to a lesser extent, all the other planets in the solar system. But the Sun's influence adds to the influence of the Moon, which explains why, when the Earth, Moon and Sun are in alignment, we have higher tides than we do when the Moon is off to the side. And finally, most of the images on the internet or anywhere else show the top image where the tidal bulges line up with the Moon, and that is also not quite the case. The middle image is more to the point where the friction of the Earth rotating around drags the tidal bulges ahead of the Moon a little bit. Not quite as much as shown here, but it's exaggerated here for purposes of illustration. And finally, a consequence of it being dragged ahead of the Moon is that the Moon's influence then slows down the rotation of the Earth, and the influence of the tidal bulge drags the Moon ahead a little bit, speeding it up and increasing its orbit, moving it further away from the Earth. All these things have been happening for 4 billion years now, so don't worry about it too much. It's not going to change the Moon as far as fishing is concerned in our lifetimes. Now so far we've been looking at assessing the water depth at low tide or high tide, but what about all the periods in between? Now these are important periods as well because a lot of the time you'll be travelling and it won't be high or low tide, so you need to know how much water is at a given spot at any given time. How do you know how much water you got there then? This is what we're going to look at now. It's called the Rule of Twelfth and it's very easy to work out in your head. In this image, the left-hand side represents the shoreline where it rises up from beneath the water to dry land. And there's a couple of lines across. One is the high water mark, the lower one is the low water mark. For the purposes of this exercise and calculating the tidal heights, we're going to say that the low water mark is at 0.3 metres and the high water mark is at 2.1 metres. And just to keep it easy, we're going to say that the low water happens at 8 o'clock in the morning and the high water happens at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that is a gap of precisely 6 hours. Again, just keeping it simple. Now the first thing we do is divide the tidal space up into 12 sections. We're dividing both the tidal rise and the time up into 12 sections and that will become clear shortly. Each of these 12 sections represents the same 0.15 metre change in the height of the tide. Now because the tidal wave, as it were, is very similar to a sine wave, we can assess just how much movement there is in any given hour. In the first hour, we move one of those sections. So the first hour, the tide moves up by 0.15 metres, or in other words, one twelfth of the total tide movement. In the second hour, it moves up two sections, or two twelfths, or 0.3 metres. In the third hour, it moves up three sections, or three twelfths, or 0.45 metres. So that's the first hour, one twelfth, the second hour, two twelfths, the third hour, three twelfths. So by the end of the third hour, if we've got our strongest tide movement, in the fourth hour, it also moves another three units, or 0.45 metres. And for all intents and purposes, that's all we need to know. The third and fourth hours have the same run. But if you really look into it, the actual strongest run is right at the end of the third hour. But as I said, for all intents and purposes, as far as fishing or boating is concerned, it's the same for those two hours. 
In the fifth hour, it only moves two units, or 0.3 metres. So you can see now that from the midpoint of the tide, the actual tidal current is starting to decrease. And in the final hour, it moves one unit, or 0.15 metres. And that's the end of the tide, it's at high tide, and that's why we say there's a calm section at either end of the tide, at the high tide or at the low tide mark. And the strongest current is in the middle of those. But that's more for fishing. The rule of twelfths is about calculating how much water there is to know whether you can make a safe passage. And once you understand how this works, it's very easy to figure out just how much water there will be at any given time during that tidal movement. You don't have to be terribly accurate, you can do this in your head. If you're needing more accuracy than about a quarter of a metre or even half a metre, then you're probably trying to make a passage where there's not enough water for your boat. And always remember too that the actual depths that you're reading on the charts are area depths. There could be unexpected rises within that, so you should leave yourself a decent margin for error. And that winds up this video and the rule of twelfth. You should have enough information now to keep you from getting into trouble. Always allow plenty of water under your boat. The bottom does go up and down, even in the areas that are marked six feet. You're going to find patches of that that are not six feet deep. So allow yourself a margin of error and just keep an eye on the water. Use common sense. If in doubt, go very, very slow. Honestly, if you're in doubt, you cannot go too slow. Whenever I'm going somewhere that I haven't been before and I know that it's going to be very marginal, I just crawl in very, very slowly. That method's never let me down yet. So anyway, thanks for watching the video. I hope you got something out of it. Until next time, good fishing.